I, I will not be in this classroom anymore. I'll probably graduate from high school. Okay, so. Hmm? He was a tragic president. To be honest, LBJ might be my favorite president because of so I will spend a whole day and tell you LBJ stories after David Gibson. Yeah. So I can't tell. Yes. Oh. Oh. Rating horse presidents. <laughs> 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 ten out of ten. Only a year. We have no historical monuments. So, you know, there's no way to know what. I mean, you really got to look 20 or 30 years back. No one said anything. What was it? It's from what? That's a bad case. Shoot. I'll find out. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm backtracking. Okay, I'll find it. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. All right, so where do we get to? Do we get to. Oh, I'll show you all the holding companies in the. Did you, oh, adopt, did you talk about oligopolies? Yes. And what? Yeah, it, it, it's a ticking time bomb for the economy. There's too many involved. Because it just eventually you're going to run out of people to buy stuff. You saw the 1920s, you see it, you saw 2008. And well, then what happens is people don't have money, they take on debt to do the basic purchases, and eventually they can't take any more debt. Okay, and that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a house of cards, closing collapses. I'll talk to you a little bit about the bank. I'll talk to you a little bit about the banking system when we get to the Great Depression and show you how. And so, with that, let's get to. We have these inequalities, and one of the big things is we have to justify where the inequalities came from. So, before we get to the Gospel of Love, there's Andrew Carnegie. We got to go back just a little bit. A new philosophy to justify this wealth. And we've always had a justification for wealth. I mean, the most famous we the blind line monarchs. You know, why are they on top? Because of God. But we need something different here. And this is where we have the, also this scientific revolution, this technological uh, engine of change. Yes. <laughs> Why do you want to steal my shadow? I don't know. I think I am filming. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Aha! Hey, you can forget, bro. Did you film that one? Hmm? Did you film lunch? Did I film lunch? I film every lunch. <laughs> so. Yeah. Shockingly boring. I just, I, then I go back and critique my just be using myself. But, so the big justification, the first thing is, we jump right into this. Laissez faire became this new ideology. But in the 20th century, this laissez faire is going to become conservative economics. It's also going to be called classical economics and deal with, I know what you're thinking, Say's Law and David Ricardo. We'll get to Say's Law. Calm down. Unless some of you are on the edge of your seat for Say's Law. Shouldn't have, said, shouldn't have said anything. That's bad. Put your head down. But this basic idea is okay, there's something that's so brand new. This new modern market, capitalism, where we have those with the capital get profit, but at the same time, take this huge amount of risk. Workers, the value of their work has changed dramatically because they no longer have the machine, they're no longer the machines of labor. They operate machines. I mean, this big shift and those massive inequalities. So what's going to come out of this is the market will be seen as natural, like the tides or the sun coming up. The market is a force of nature, meaning that humans did not create, the markets just happen and they appear. Now you have to suspend logic a little bit because that's not the way it happened. Hmm? With the wild market. Yeah, it, no, these were created by humans. There are laws that regulate it. There are laws that allow for certain things to happen in the market. Not. We saw that just yesterday. 
when states tried very hard to limit the size of corporations, in what state? What state would allow for holding companies? New Jersey. These are laws. You change the laws and you have more concentration or less concentration of wealth. But they don't want less concentration. They want more concentration, so then the market's natural. And here's another big thing that what are we? We are just individuals in the as economic entities in the market. We are nothing more than an individual in the market. We buy and sell goods. We make goods. We produce, we consume, that's all we are. We work, we hire, that's all we are. Economic entities within the market. All these little individuals, all on our own in the marketplace, to be bought and sold like any other commodity. Some commodities are obviously more valuable than others in this concept. But that's all we are in this idea. We are individuals in this natural market commodities. And so with that, if that's all natural, there should be no government interference. Why would government mess with the way nature functions? Except to make nature better, right? Don't we want to do that? And how do you make nature better? Help those, well they can actually call it, I like this, proper conditions for the market. Meaning, help those who prosper in the market continue to prosper. If they prosper in the market, that must mean they were meant to prosper. So shouldn't we help them? Why would you ever help individuals that are not doing well in the market, aka poor, or working class? Won't that bring nature down? Help the market. So, one thing to put on there. I did not type. So, this idea, who do you want to help? Help the suppliers of goods. Help who produces the goods. Those who have the capital. Another term for this will be supply side microeconomics, which is also called trickle. This is the essence of it. But, Still, by definition, you're really only helping a certain group. So you're getting a couple different things that come out of this. First off, this idea of this concept of the gospel of success. And this will begin the shifting of an American dream. Kind of, remember the old American dream about that little piece of land, call it your own, a yeoman. Remember the yeoman? Now, the individual. And what success? which will allow you to have a lot of wealth. So a series of books were written by Horatio Alger that really pushed this individual myth. And there were all these rags to riches stories about these little boys who had nothing at all. And you know, they were a paper boy, or they were a, you know, an orphan on the plains and through their toughness and greediness and courage, intelligence, and luck, they became rich. And a, a little boy in a Horatio Alger novel who are best sellers. If you can become rich, what does it say about you? And if you don't become rich, whose fault is it? Your own fault. There's something wrong with you. They became overnight successes. They're not very good books. By the way, Horatio Alger, it's actually a pen name. There's a bunch of authors. Anyone ever read like a Hardy Boys book or a Nancy Drew book? I I love those books, but they're written by a number of different authors. No. And it set this idea of the self-made man. The self-made man is very important. And there's a, there is an element of truth. Hard work and all, you know, unlock and a number of other things can lead to success, but it's always more complex. But what kind of people like the mythology of the self-made man? Say it again. The poor people, it's like, gives them a chance, something to look up to. There is an element of that. Who else really likes it? Because then they could say, hey, I made it. Sink or swim. Why should I help you? Or why should we set the system to help you? Especially what's crazy thing about school. Punks. 
That's all film we've seen. Calling the schools. Yes. Have you ever read one of them? Yeah, they're awful. To my point of view, they're boring, pretty silly stories. And I like, you know, I, I had a, when I was a kid, I had a bunch of like, little, little, you know, kids' books. And I had a few Horatio Alger ones. And so I just got done reading a few. Red Old Yellow, that's sad. Uh, Charlotte's Web sad, too, I remember that. But, this is why I read the one of those, I was like, this is off. But, and that leads to the dominant philosophy of the, because it's the end of the 19th. The dominant philosophy of the 20th century, and it is still the dominant philosophy into the 21st century. Social Darwinism. And it comes out of this rich, relatively wealthy aristocrat by the name of Herbert Spencer, who was this landed aristocrat in England. So literally, this is, remember I told you about some people, you know, they through observation, they came up with ideas. So he literally is in the Iron Tower. He and his mutton chops are basically just pondering life. Why are some people on top, why are some people on the bottom? Yeah. No, they're not related, but that's interesting. From Whitefish. Uh, Whitefish. But, Herbert Spencer was trying to figure, trying to look at, okay, why are, why am I rich? Why do I have wealth? Why do some industrials have wealth? And some people live in abject poverty in places nearby, like for him, Manchester. Even though he'd never really been there, he was just wondering this. And one of the big things is, it's very important. He doesn't want to admit that he's wealthy because he won the Burris lottery. He was born with wealthy, with born with aristocratic parents who had in the country and state. He wanted it to be something special about him. There must be something better about him. So it might be involving his parents, but there must be something special about him. And the other thing is this. To his point of view, he was very lost out there. He thought, okay, I don't want people to mess with what I have. I want to believe I got it on my own. There's something good about me. I'm a self-made man. What's the old joke like? He was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. But Spencer, when he came up with this, he's trying to, he's thinking about this. I mean, it's bothering him. He wants it to be more than greed or outright luck, just random chance. And then I should have put a hyphen there, but I didn't. The book Origin of Species came out about natural selection, 1851. Who wrote The Origin of Species? Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin was actually in competition with three other scientists. He was going to write a, write a multi volume set. He wasn't quite sure about the science, and there might be some other little issues with his theories. But then, when he realized somebody else might publish, he quickly wrote out a summary. <laughs> and so that's we remember Charles Darwin. And Darwin laid out an idea that had been bouncing around for 70 years. Actually, longer than that, this goes back to Greek philosophy, but. Uh, oh, good, okay. And what Darwin laid out is this concept of natural selection. He was not alone in this. He was not like Spencer. He was not up pondering his navel. I'm like, ooh, I come up with something. <laughs> That's the uh, the, uh, sign, the uh, philosophers uh, uh, was always pondering their navel. <laughs> I don't ponder most, but in it, he laid out something that had been bothering people since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Even before this, because it was really noticeable with this, after digging, digging that all the canals, but especially the mines with the coal or iron or whatever else it might be, two things. First off, fossils of animals that did not exist anymore. That shook them to their very core. Not just everything they believe, but also their faith. What's well, supposed to be like this? Especially their Christian faith. Because this was shocking. And there's something else. As they dug down, they realized that the earth was significantly older than they thought. This was through observation by everybody from those who worked at mines to naturalists for the new romantic era to these new growing 
geologist or biologist, what we call at the end of the century, different levels of science. That those would all come about those terms at the end of the 19th century. So they're seeing all this stuff. How did it happen? Well, they went hand in hand. We have animals that um, either species have disappeared or like different variations of species that exist, combined with the fact that the Earth appears to be much older than people believed. That goes hand in hand. First off, I should say this off of Earth. You know what peat is? Yeah. The means of culture. Yeah, and they're like layers of moss. So some areas like in, I don't say Ireland, but but there's some areas in like France, and it's really good for coal because the years of pressure will push it down for coal. So they must have these early mines. And some in France, there's one field of peat, that ancient field of peat that's perfect for coal, and left every layer of peat perfectly intact as they got down. So think about every layer, it's like little lines, is one year. And one mine as they dug down. They started counting the layers and blew them away. Millions. The world is old. They just blew them away. Can't even begin to describe what a big deal that was. Another good one is anyone know where Mount Etna is? It's still an active volcano. It'll close. Right here, right by Naples. You ever heard of Pompeii? Yes. The Roman city covered by yeah. Well, and actually during World War II, when the British, the U.S., Canadians, Free French invaded Italy, soon after the volcano erupted, kind of weird. Right during the war, we had a erupting volcano where there's these volcanic fissures. So imagine like these cones of granite around the base of a volcano, and it was clear these granite cones were incredibly old because they could tell by granite by where it was very old. Under these were layers of limestone with fossils, and there were layers with fossils of, of species that did not exist over fossils of species that did exist under these volcanic fissures. The world had to be millions of years old. They just blew them away, and that's where we get to natural selection. Because natural selection, the only way this is even conceivable is you need a time that we can't even comprehend. Much longer than there has been human civilizations for these changes to happen. And what natural selection is this, species or subspecies, some kind of, they have some kind of adaptation that can adapt to a changing environment. They survive. But species that do not have these adaptations, what happens to them? They die off. And therefore those adaptations are spread off to the next generation. And that's why you get different subspecies of animals with different variations because they have different environmental changes to adapt to. And it's in a much longer time frame than there have been human civilization. So you can't look back and how much have we naturally selected from the time of the Sumerians? There really hasn't been time. Maybe tomorrow. But big deal. And it does not mean what you think of evolution. It's not that they're like, there's like this natural evolution that's happening. That implies not only that there's some kind of like plan thing, but also that it's evolving to like a superior being. So if you, if you look at like a sea or a slug, I don't know why I would say a slug, but why not a slug, right? It's not someday going to evolve into a human being. You know, keep working, someday you'll make it. <laughs> but, okay, that was cruel, wasn't it? I just stepped on an imaginary slide. But, <laughs> yeah, I know. Just so that's, that's my human evolution. The green man. Yeah. Have you ever seen the, the universe was planned out of the calendar? I've wanted to. I'm going to talk about it's that. It's crazy. It's too many lights and blink of an eye. It is that, though, yeah. And civilization's even a shorter one. But, there isn't that picture of like, you know, they have the evolution thing, they have like a monkey. Yeah, I saw someone wearing a shirt, that's why I think of my shirt, like a monkey, then like an ape, a measure up to a human. That's not natural selection. Monkeys are not evolving into people, and we did not evolve from monkeys. Monkeys evolved from other monkeys. But there's natural selection from, we have a common ancestor. 
And some adaptations branched off to different primates, and some branched off to be humans. We have common ancestors, but we're not from monkeys. Well, then what, what did we evolve from? Common ancestors, so like, a primate. How did it evolve? We didn't evolve from the natural selection. So, so, so primates and monkeys are all different. Well, they, we have common ancestors. We're a primate, but we have a common ancestor, but we're not monkeys. <laughs> We're humans. But the reason I'm telling you this is a couple things about this. First off, this is very important thing for our Darwin. Were they the, the toughest, the meanest, the strongest species that survived? No. They could adapt. Mice survived. Tyrannosaurus Rex, Rex did not survive. Who would win in a fight? A weedy mouse. Or, so it's not the strongest, it's who could adapt. I mean, I could be a lion, but most of you could not. I like sleeping fries. I, I have a tough job. And beat up a honey in the But, did you leave me? But, no, no, let's get back to this. So, the same society. Spencer read this and it's like, yes, exactly. So we have this environment where everyone's struggling for life and some make it and some not. Let's take that idea of the natural environment and say that's what we got to get. Spencer took that idea of the natural environment to civilization, society. And society is exactly the same when natural selection works here. And those best able to adapt to the changing, what is this, what is it? Market. Get rich. And those who can't adapt, what are they? Oh, weak. Weak. Inferior. There's something wrong with them. So Spencer could say, I'm supposed to be on top. It's natural like the sun going up in the morning. And he coined the term, this is all simply the survival <laughs> of the fittest. That's not Darwin. Darwin hated this term. That's Spencer. The survival of the fittest. So that implies that those who are poor are unfit. Wait a minute, if you're a government, why should you ever help the unfit? So wait, Darwin didn't actually come up with that term? No, Darwin hated it. Darwin hated the survival of the fittest, and he despised his ideas, and for his whole life hated the fact that they started calling him social violence. In fact, he was a socialist who was a gap opposite. He looked at it and he said, no, wait a second. Society, we make choices. It's not the environment. We are humans who can make choices. No. And so, who liked this philosophy? Not only that, what about the weak? It's not. It sounds like science, doesn't it? The weak, the poor, there's something wrong with them. And this is going to be used over and over again. They're morally corrupt. There must be something wrong inside of them that makes them poor. Makes them just a worker and they can't move up. Doesn't mean they're necessarily good or bad, it's just they're morally corrupt. Why should we ever help the morally corrupt? In fact, who should we help? If you're going to create a society, who do you help? Do you want the society down the road to be made of fit, strong people, or corrupt, morally inferior? Yes. The way to help get to a society in which all things help them came to their right. You're making me weak, just saying. <laughs> yes. So, who liked this philosophy? Like yeah, oh. Carnegie. Well, in fact, a number of the very wealthy, like Gould and Hannah and a few others in the late, excuse me, late eighteen seventies, brought him over. Brought him to New York City. Made him like a conquering hero. Yes. Think about Carnegie, who was actually really worried about the practices he was doing might send him to hell. And now here's somebody who's saying, "I'm not going to go to hell because it's natural." Why should I mourn the passing of the dinosaur? And why should I mourn fortune? It's the same thing. 
I did nothing wrong by cutting your wages by 60%. No. I'm supposed to be on the bottom. No, I'm just telling you. Remember the homestead strike? That's what happened. So they met him. And so they actually took him to the poorest area of New York City called the Five Falls region. So think about Manhattan Island, it's this big, rocky, granite island, but there's a little depression, it's kind of swampy. They call it Five Falls because Five Road just had an end in one spot. And it's the poorest area of the city at that time. It's called, it's called the Bowery. And all the poorest immigrants and everyone else came there. So people lived in absolute hovel, in misery, with gangs and crime and open sewage. They took Spencer there almost like, see? Look at these unfit people live. It's exactly like you said, and Spencer was appalled. No, wait, wait, wait. This is just supposed to be like philosophy. You're not supposed to treat people like this. It actually kind of shocked them. And what did his benefactors think? No, and they sent it back to England. They had to find somebody who would say what they wanted and didn't bother about or didn't worry about the conditions of the poor. Should add though, very dominant philosophy, but nobody likes to be called social Darwinist much anymore. Because who else really likes social Darwinism? Racists. Well, not Germany in general, but who in Germany? Yeah, this is, oh yeah. Fascism and Nazism is social Darwinism taken to its most extreme. Yes. What about the South? And I was about ready to mention it, so I'm glad you did. Doesn't this sound a lot like the positive good theory of slavery? But now this is more, even more science. -y. So William Graham Sumner, he was the American Spencer, and he had no qualms. He was a professor from Yale. His best known book would be Folkways in 1906, but he was already doing this in the 1880s. And he pushed it to the next level. And this should fit in with that economics thing I just talked about. Because what, yep, oh, I'm sorry, these two things. First off, all the individual is is in the struggle for life, which is the market. So remember when I said that? He's the one who really established that. The market is the environment. Therefore, government intervention won't do any good. Why help with the market? Now look at it this way. Why should the government help the impoverished, the bottom, let's say, 90%? Even the bottom 50%. Why should they help the people in the five forms? If they're morally corrupt and unfit, and that's why they're poor, if you help them by providing them food or shelter or, okay, at the end of the century, health care, because they might actually live with the hospital. Hospitals used to be places to go die. Eventually, they'd be a place where maybe perhaps they'd be cured. It's a big shift. You help them today, what are they going to be tomorrow? No, they're going to be the same morally unfit person, and now you've just perpetuated it. Heck, they'll probably have children and just perpetuate children, they'll just perpetuate that. If you help the poor, you're just helping suppress, you're helping to spread that immorality. <laughs> it is the dominant philosophy in the United States of the day. No, I mean, just, what did they just do? We have a system in the United States that was passed in 1965 called Medicaid, which is uh, attempt help, is healthcare for, we have no substance in healthcare. <laughs> I, I can't even begin to tell you even how it happened. But it gives healthcare for the poor, for poor people, people on the bottom of the economic scale. And they just, the, they just change the rules to make it more difficult for poor people to get help. <laughs> and what's the argument? We got to get them off dependency because they just don't work. Sure. <laughs> so that is the dominant philosophy today. So government intervention is futile unless it goes to the people who are meant to succeed. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what does that mean? Those people are doing well in the market. Shouldn't we help them? That perpetuates this fitness and increases wealth in the country, doesn't it? So who should government help? 
those who are the Catholic, the wealthy. <laughs> Help them, then they will they will bring prosperity in the market, and that will benefit everybody. Help the suppliers, and the money will flow down. Or using the terminology of the 1920s, <laughs> trickle down. And that is, well, we just passed a tax law. And about over 83% of the benefits go to the top 1%. That is meant to get more money to the hands of the very wealthy. I mean, they're not hiding it. That's, that's the plan to get as much wealth in their hands. Now, you can argue whether or not that's good or bad policy. But the economic argument is that they will take that money and build factories and provide jobs and it will spread down to those people who don't know how to deal with the money. We'll get to the people who do know what to do. And that's supply side economics. I'll tell you more about exactly how it works, but that comes from this. I guess you could probably see the opposite idea. Yeah. We're not there <laughs> This is a progression. I'll give you it now, but we have to get to the 1920s. It depends, a lot of it depends on who you are, but moving on. And that leads directly to Alex, Sandra Carnegie. Because Carnegie was overjoyed with social Darwinism. But his problem was he really wanted to go to heaven. And he was worried about this. He wanted to be this, even though, yes, he got rich, but he looked out for the poor and his workers. That's why he left town when they broke the Union and Homestead. He didn't want to be tainted <laughs> by what was going to happen there. So he went to Scotland. So he wanted to, he really had this, i got to go to heaven. And so he would write a book where he not only proclaimed his love of social Darwinism, but also the love of who should naturally be on top. The Anglo-Saxon race. <laughs> Those are the people that should, should be on top of wealth, power, control government, and bring civilization to the world. The Anglo-Saxon race. Well, who are Anglo-Saxons? Well, they are white, but what country? Yeah, the Britain. Uh, Anglos and Saxons are Germans who cross the channel. And so, yeah, so basically what he's talking when he says Anglo-Saxon, what does he mean? Northern Europe. The book, the article was called The Gospel of Love. The book would be called On Love. So we just call it, we generically call it The Gospel of Love. And pro, very much pro social Darwinism. And this was the most racist time. Can you see how social Darwinism blends quite nicely with racism? Quite nice. What a weird way to put it, huh? Nice blending with racism. But wealth is good. It shows that God has blessed you. And therefore, how you get the wealth is fine. He's going to heaven. And inequalities are fine. It's natural. There's going to be people on top, people on the bottom. <laughs> but the big deal is what do you do with your wealth once you get it? Do you build mansions and throw money around and burn it in fireplaces and have extravagant shows of wealth? What Carnegie said is get your money any way you want. That's fine. But then philanthropy. Give it back. And that's why you have this cartoon of, of him throwing out money. Double check. I just had we failed. You know, it's so easy just to set something down the wrong way. Okay, so philanthropy. Sure, but here's the big deal. Who do you give money to? He believes in social Darwinism. If you give money to poor folk, what would they do with it? If you give money to working people, what would they do with it? Don't just drink it away or whatever. In fact, this is what he called them in his article. The unworthy. 
They would just drink it away or women or movies. Senator Grassley of Iowa just said that about about food stamps. I just thought that was, yeah. Movies, women. I assume whoever you are is going to spend the wrong way. Okay, so you just waste it. You're just giving it away. So what do you got to do is you got to set up something. In fact, he knew best. And so what he looked at it is the rich are essentially gone and <laughs> replaced with Green Day. They're very political too, but that's another story. And they'll be like, they will help their poor brother. They will show them the way. See, they're rich, so they know how to do it. So they will set up the system. So for example, after he broke the workers at the homestead strike and got their pay and hired to put in the workers, to help them, he, they, he built them an opera house. <laughs> Don't worry yourself about that. <laughs> but he did a lot of amazing things. But he said, I know what's best for you. So, for example, almost every library in the country, got started, including Halloween, got started with a Carnegie endowment. And that's, I, I think, a, a fantastic thing. But the idea was, okay, if you're part of this unwashed mass, if you're the un, you're something wrong with you, but maybe your when your children can will help them, they might have a chance to get out. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. That's exactly fraternalism. Yes. Is that why the library and Exactly. Mal City was the Carnegie Library. Yes. And that's what Carnegie Hall. Have you ever heard about that? Yes. But you know, it's not direct aid. And this is, he didn't have to do it at all. This is very complex, but I can't help but be a little bit cynical about the Opera House. Yeah. You know who's like this? Bill Gates. Bill Gates is like this. You know what Father Four came from? Uh, no, uh, Bill Gates. The man who made a new 